Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Good afternoon, welcome to the Global Report. I'm your host, Lily Ong. Today we'll be talking about cryptocurrency and the various mobile payment methods. We have with us today uh, Mr. Danny Francis. He's the co-founder at the Vault, a uh, security blockchain company. Welcome to the show, Mr. Francis. Thank you, welcome. Yeah. Now, Mr. Francis, before we have you explain to us how blockchain technology works, could you give us a little background on um, cryptocurrency, how it started and how it came about? Uh, well, I mean, the cryptocurrency uh, phenomenon actually started quite a, a while ago um, with the, the creation of the blockchain uh, technology, um, which is it's basically a, a way of managing transactions, whether they're financial or other kinds of transactions. Um, and when those transactions happen, they, they happen on a peer-to-peer -peer network in a distributed environment. What it, what it means is each transaction forms a, a, a ledger and that ledger can never be changed. It's un unlike the kind of way that computing is done now. Think of it as, as if um, you're writing a journal um, and you're recording a, making a record in that journal and you've got 100,000 people watching you at the same time record, make, make that, that, that record. It can never be changed, everyone's witnessed it. Um, but of course in the, the, the technology it's not 100,000 people but it's miners that, that come and verify that the transactions uh, have been made. And once they're done they're immutable, they can't be changed. Um, and it's, it, it creates a, um, a trustless peer-to-peer -peer network. When I say trustless, um, I mean the, the, the kind of centralised system that we have today is banking. Um, that requires trusted third parties, that's what ties us into banks and payment gateways like Visa and MasterCard. And governments. And governments. But mm -hmm. uh, where is this, it, it, it doesn't, the, 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 the people that come and verify um, the, the transaction, the verify that you have what, what you say you have, and the person that is buying what you have, that they have the, the currency to make mm -hmm. the transaction. So it all happens without um, the trusted third party, the government, the, the, the banks needing to do anything at all. Of course, the governments and banks can participate, but at the moment, they're, they're well behind companies such as ours. Mm -hmm. Now, when you say it's immutable, it cannot be changed or deleted, what if a mistake is made? I mean, how would I rectify that? Well, it, 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 it can't be made. So let's say we, we have, a, we, we, we have a, a, an agreement, and in, in blockchain technology, it's called a smart contract. Mm -hmm. So I've got something that, that you want to buy, for example, and so we, the, the smart contract is made. The, the, uh, on the, in blockchain technology, the, the miners come along and verify that you know, I've, got the, I've got what I say I've got. They verify that you've got the, the, the money. When those terms are met, the exchange happens. Okay. So it's as, as simple as that. If you don't have what you say you have, if you don't have enough money to pay for it, the, the contract terms can't be met. And so, and, and so the, the, the contract won't happen. And how are the contract firms being, being verified? So suppose you have a place for rent and I want to rent it from you, can we do that through a smart contract? Oh, absolutely. Okay, absolutely. And, and who is going to come in and verify that all the, all the contractual terms are being met? You, well, you, you don't need to because once a contract's been made and you, you've paid for the, the, the rent, then it's protected. If somehow there's a, there's a dispute, then there's dispute resolution systems to, to, to manage that. But the initial payment, that, that's taken care of in the, the initial smart contract. Mm -hmm. So when you have multiple contracts and ongoing, then of course you need additional um, oversight to, to govern that. Mm -hmm. Now I was going to um, ask about that because um, since there's no third party like the banks, credit company and government, who's going to come in to, um, I guess, um, referee a dispute? There, there, there are ways to, to do that, but of course you can always fall back on the, on the law to, to uh, come in and play the, the role that it does. Mm -hmm. um, because there's a record of what's happened, um, they, then they've got something that can't be changed that they can go back and, re and, and refer to. So it, actually it does away with a lot of disputes 
be, because there's no way to say, oh, look, I, I, I didn't make that transaction or um, I paid too much or I didn't pay enough or because the terms have been held. Because everything is recorded and then there's, exactly. there's witness mm -hmm. all along the way. Yep. Okay. Now, as far as our regulation, because you've really mentioned that, you know, if, if there's any uh, dispute, uh, what are the government regulations surrounding blockchain or cryptocurrency? There, there's, um, there are regulations. So it, it's been in the, the past uh, six, eight months that the governments have started regulating what's going on in, in to do with cryptocurrencies, to do with initial coin offerings, which are um, uh, a recent uh, phenomenon. Um, so tell us more about initial coin offering. What is that? So initial coin offering. So you've probably heard of um, uh, companies doing a, a, an IPO, an initial public offering, mm -hmm. uh, and for that, then there's uh, banks are involved, there's stock exchanges involved, there's uh, large sums of money that are paid up front. Um, so the, the, the bankers can um, guarantee that these things are going to go along and then there's a lot of due diligence in audit, etc. It takes a, a long time to execute. Mm -hmm. You need to be uh, an established company, have significant um, uh, business transactions already underway before you can do something like that. And then there's other ways of fundraising, venture capital. So young companies that may have only just started or not even started a, a business could go to a venture capital and raise funds through a venture capital. So I've, for example, I've got a great idea. I'm gonna create an airline that's gonna fly between Hawaii and Singapore. And that's the only route it's gonna do because I've got dedicated audience in, in each market. And I'm, I know I can fill my planes up on, on that route. And so I take that great idea and I go to, um, uh, a VC and maybe a venture capital person can invest in it and I can raise money that way. It takes a, usually a lot of time. Maybe I've got to go and see 20 VCs before I find someone that's interested in uh, investing uh, in me. And initial coin offering is quite different. Initial coin offering um, usually involves a, a, a company. It could be a brand new startup. It could be going for a few years. It could be a more established company as well. But the company makes uh, creates a, a token uh, and then makes those tokens available for sale. And there's a couple of different types of token. I won't go into that just yet. But so the, the ICO, the initial coin offering, is about uh, individuals or companies, institutional investors, coming in and buying those tokens because they see that in the future those tokens will appreciate in value yeah. and so therefore they, they can make money through that. So because there's a lot of interest in cryptocurrency at the moment, there's a lot of people interested in buying tokens from new startup companies where they think, okay, the token might be worth one cent today, but if it's worth a dollar somewhere in the future, I've made a hundred times my money. Yeah. So it's a very attractive prospect to do small level bidding in companies that are doing blockchain-based businesses. Mm -hmm. Now, are these tokens um, structured in a form of securities? Because I'm thinking about regulations. Um, for example, Singapore, the Monetary Authority of Singapore does not have any regulations over virtual currencies per se, um, but they do have regulations over activities surrounding you know, those virtual currencies. And if they are structured in a form of securities, I imagine the government will come in and... Oh, that's... And, yeah. and that, that, that's right. So th th there's really there's um, for our needs today there's two types of tokens one is a, a security and the other is a utility so uh, a security is is quite simple to to define for our, our terms now so um, let, let's say I'm selling you a share in my company right so it's a it, it's it, it's a part of my company that, that, that I'm, I'm selling to you. Um, I'm, I'm giving you equity in the company. And, and that's, that's a security. I'm gonna give you a, a share form and you're gonna hope that share form uh, is worth something more in the, <clears throat> in the future. A utility token is quite different. So uh, for the way that um, a, a lot of companies do it is let's say my company is going to enable transactions in, in a, a new uh, kind of blockchain exchange um, and to power those transactions we're going to use tokens so the people that use our t 
technology to make the transaction will buy tokens to, to do it. So those tokens that I'm selling are actually a utility. Think of you know, how you pay for electricity. Or you're paying for this service. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're selling. We're, we're, we're not selling equity into our company. We're, we're, we're selling tokens that have a value. Uh, and, and so th those tokens will hopefully increase in value the more people that want to use our network to make more transactions. Mm -hmm. So what might be worth one cent today could be worth $100 tomorrow. Now, being that everything is digital and done online, what about uh, as far as security goes? I mean, have you seen malicious attacks, hackings? Uh, yeah, what the, are the safeguards against? Uh, yeah, the, the, the most uh, famous one, I guess, is the uh, $570 million hack that was done against CoinCheck in Japan um, uh, uh, back in January. Um, because the, the, the blockchain exchanges that, that um, have been established so far. Some of them have good security, some of them don't have good security. Obviously in the case of uh, CoinCheck then someone um, was able to hack into their network and then divert uh, NEO tokens to, uh, to, to a, a, an address elsewhere, which has been tracked down actually. So hacking um, you know, in the blockchain world it is maybe a good idea but getting your money and actually stealing it um, is a whole other thing that needs to be coordinated. Um, so it's not like if um, we hacked into a bank and we were able to divert money to a Swiss account and then we just go and empty the Swiss account and take it over somewhere else. Um, you know, that's how we think of hacking in, in the, the old world in, in blockchain. You're taking it from an address and sending it to an address that can be identified. Mm. So kind of trace where it is. Um, so it's, it, it is different. So, but yeah, there, there's, there's issues over security. People are concerned because the technology is not uh, pervasive enough to have a lot of understanding. There's not enough regulation around who does what. So that's kind of what my company is doing mm. to come in and, and make sure that there's kind of um, an, an escrow between when the, the when the payment starts and before it's delivered over there, mm -hmm. we first have to verify that these two addresses are real um, mm -hmm. and, and that, that it can be done. So we're, in a sense, we're managing the transaction. We're man making sure that these two people are not money launderers, mm -hmm. making sure they're not terrorists, making sure that, that, that it's not a fraudulent activity. We know who they are and, and we can manage it. So, um, so security is a, is a big concern. Um, and, and you know we've partnered with a, a great company um, a career to provide that service to get around mm -hmm. uh, people's concerns about security. Now given that everything can be traced to a source, why then is the government um, you know um, why, why did they raise the issues of money laundering and, and funding terrorism? Because, we, because when, when uh, the technology first uh, came out, it's a it's a peer-to-peer -peer trustless technology. So, so originally and in the, the early days and, and still for, for many of the, the, the companies now, um, they don't have KYC or know your customer mm -hmm. uh, rules. Um, so whoever can get in there and, 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 uh, and, and deal with it. Um, so if so the governments are, are concerned about um, terrorists, they're concerned about money laundering. They're also concerned about the loss of tax revenues that they can uh, receive um, if, if everything went, went through channels that they could, that they could uh, more properly audit uh, and track. Um, but that, that, that's happening. As uh, you can see, Singapore, America, uh, Australia, Korea, uh, China, they're, they're all putting in place um, regulations so that they can put an end to um, the complete uh, privacy of, of what's happening there. And so there's know your customer, there's anti-money laundering, there, there's um, uh, fraud detection services in place. And to enable them to collect taxes too. 
I'm sure. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much. We're going to take a little break here, and we'll come back. We'd love to talk, um, have you um, tell us more about the various uh, mobile payment platforms. Ah, my pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. That's you. I want to know, will you watch my show? I hope you do. It's on Tuesdays at 1 o'clock, and it's out of the comfort zone, and I'll be your host, R.B. Kelly. See you there. Hello, everyone. I'm DeSoto Brown, the co-host of Human Humane Architecture, which is seen on Think Tech Hawaii every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. And with the show's host, Martin Despang, we discuss architecture here in the Hawaiian Islands and how it not only affects the way we live, but other aspects of our life, not only here in Hawaii, but internationally as well. So join us for Human Humane Architecture every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. Welcome back to the Global Report. Today we're talking about cryptocurrency and the various mobile payment platforms. We have with us today Mr. Danny Frances, who is the co-founder of the Vault, a blockchain security firm. Welcome back to the show, Mr. Frances. Thank you. Now, Mr. Frances, could you share with us some of the different types of mobile payment platforms that are out there? Right, there, there there's, I guess there's a number of uh, uh, mobile emerging payment uh, platforms that are quite common in um, around. What do they call it? There's a number of emerging payment, mm -hmm. I guess we, 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 we call them. So there's, you know, MasterCard has MasterPass. Mm -hmm. um, there's Stripe, there's Braintree, PayPal. Um, all of those are, are vehicles that, or, or are, are payment uh, gateways that mobile vendors are embedding in uh, phone devices so that you can purchase things from retail stores, you can buy your cup of coffee in the morning. <clears throat> um, it, they can be married with loyalty programs. Um, and it's usually the, the tokenization of a, a credit card or a debit card. Once that tokenization happens, um, security layers are put in place to protect it and then it's put on your phone. So you can use your phone to, you may ha have seen in places like Australia where people you know, tap their phone using NFC technology um, or it could be uh, done on a location uh, basis using Bluetooth or, or just using pairing um, a phone with a, a point of sale terminal. There, there's uh, several ways that you can enable that. Mm -hmm. Now when I tap my phone to that, what kind of information is being transferred? <clears throat> just, just payments as if you're handing over your credit card and they're swiping it at the terminal. So they get no other information um, at all uh, uh, about, the, about the user except that they check with the bank that you have enough money in the bank to cover the transaction. <clears throat> and while I say that, um, some companies will offer payment technology on a de device in exchange for gathering things about your behaviour. Mm. What you buy, when you buy, how much you spend in a week. Is, where is you the customer aware of that? Or are yeah, oh yes, in, in, in those sort of things that the customer need to be aware. In Singapore we have you know, uh, privacy laws. In Australia there's privacy laws to, to protect uh, consumers from, um, from anyone trying to gather that information without their awareness. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned that it can be paired with uh, customer loyalty programs. Could you give us an example of how that works? Say I go to you know a cafe and buy a cup of coffee. Right, so um, quite common are things like Starbucks store, stored value card. Um, with Starbucks it's a, it's a bit clunky. Um, you, you have to go and buy a physical card and, and then you scan the card to tokenize it in your, in your device. And then when you make a payment, and sorry, and then you add, add funds to, to that card, um, and then when you come into the store, you can make an order and, and use the funds that are in your card to, to pay with. When you are paying, are you tapping your phone or tapping the card? Uh, with, with Starbucks in Asia, it's scanning at a terminal. Mm -hmm. With um, the phone or the card? With a, with a QR code on the phone. Oh, okay. Because um, the card's been embedded in the phone. But then there's companies like uh, Loke, um, and, and Loke um, uh, 
do away with all that clunkiness. Um, they embed the card, uh, your, your card, into the application. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> uh, it could be Starbucks. Um, in, in this case, you wouldn't have to get a card, download it. Right. You, you, you just do your, your own credit card. Mm -hmm. And then when you make a purchase, you get points. Mm -hmm. As those points build up, you can use those points to make a purchase. And the company is, of course, collecting information on what type of purchase you made and the, so that. So, that, that's, so uh, places like Starbucks, Coffee Bean, um, Yakum Cafe can uh, gather information and, and improve services to customers. Mm -hmm. So customers are made aware that the, this behaviour information is known um, before they, they, they sign on. But they get discounts and they get value for being part of that process. Right. What is the capital cost? What does it look like for for a merchant to say, okay, I want to implement this in my chain of stores? Is, is there a very high capital cost involved? It, it does vary from from um, from vendor to vendor. So there's probably five or six vendors in Singapore that that, that do it. Some will do it very cheaply in terms of setup. But they don't do native mobile application development. They do web development, which is lower cost, less secure. Mm. Um, and so you find with with those kind of vendors, they're they're not so um, liked by the banks because of lack of security. Mm. But then the credit card companies will, will not have endorsed them because they won't have passed the 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 the, the uh, rules required for credit card uh, tokenization. Um, so, so it could be as as low as fifty dollars a month per outlet. Um, there, there's you know companies like Loke do a thousand dollars to set up the outlet, and then one hundred dollars a month um, on small outlets. It's very reasonable. Ones. That's very it's reasonable. A, it's a reasonable cost considering the the, the benefits to the merchant, which. Uh, uh, an uplift in revenues of more than eight uh, percent, increase in margin of more than five percent. Significant if you're if you're you know turning over a hundred thousand dollars a month, and it's more than a person's more than a staff's wage increase in your in your margin. Mm -hmm. so. And if capital cost is not exactly a barrier, to, uh, what are some of the barriers that you have seen in your industry? The barriers are probably the integration with the point of sale. So there's point of sale vendors who. Um, some are very open and some are very closed, but they're usually relationships that have been married with the merchant for for some time, um, and to change rules like in any marriage could be a mm -hmm. difficult thing. Mm -hmm. And what about uh, educating the, the the customers, the consumers? Um, I, I imagine that you know the older generation might be more technophobic. You'd be surprised. Um, uh, women uh, between the age of of uh, 50 and 65 are among the most mobile savvy, mm. um, much more mobile savvy than their equivalent aged uh, males. Mm -hmm. um, uh, male males are, uh, of that era are, are more likely to not, not be uh, mobile savvy. Uh, women have, uh, have been smartphone adopters and, and game players. Uh, surprisingly, um, so so it, it comes from it, it comes from that. So the older generation actually don't have uh, too many issues, and, and the the smarter the applications get, the easier it is for them to uh, for for them to uh, manage and and find their way. Mobile apps today are very intuitive, so you know there used to be um, tutorials required. You know when you downloaded an app, there'd be use the app and do this, do that, step mm -hmm. one, step two, step three. Um, uh, with the company uh, that that uh, I was with uh, before, we found that no one was using those things anymore. So we don't have to include them anymore because people are, uh, are over or uh, knowledgeable enough about mobile apps that they can navigate fairly easily. Mm -hmm. And uh, looking at just Asia alone, um, what do you think is the percentage of penetration, market penetration for such technology? How many merchants, what's the percentage of merchants that have already picked it up? It's um, happening It's happening fast uh, now. I think that it's kind of growing with some pace. So there's a bank in Singapore called DBS, and DBS is really pioneering 
uh, what's happened in the area. I think DBS already has uh, 2,000, one half to 2,000 outlets. Um, doing it, they're, they're targeting over 20,000 outlets um, in the next 12 to 18 months. Um, uh, in, in Australia, there's, there, there's probably um, loyalty and payment. Uh, you know, I can just think of three companies that would have more than 10,000 outlets between them. Um, in Korea, uh, I know of uh, a company called Dodo Point that has over a million uh, merchants using it. So. Wow. And do you operate mostly um, within the Asian region or do you have clients outside of the Asian region as well? Asia Pacific. Right. Um, uh, we're a global company, mm -hmm. so but but the the technology that that we've developed has been focused in um, Australia, spread to Asia Pacific. Now we're setting up US and UK. Um, Do you uh, encounter attitudes. different types of difficulty as you bring them to different regions? Surprisingly, no. Um, you know, Asia has been a market that's more mobile savvy than the West, um, but the West has has uh, caught up in the last couple of years. America was very slow in, in coming to um, the, the mark, but... What, why do you think that is so? Why, why are they slow in adopting it? it? They're, they're slow in adopting all kinds of payment technologies. Um, Americans were still writing out checks when the rest of the world was saved <laughs> bye-bye. In cash. Um, <laughs> and the, the, even the, the, the kind of technology they used on the credit cards it was generation behind what was happening in Asia. Um, and Australia is quite fortunate because it, it, it followed the the Asian uh, uh, technology and the Asian way of doing it. So the adoption mm -hmm. in Australia is very good, <coughs> and the adoption in the UK, France, Germany. It's all what delightful. do you think is slow in America? Do you think um, government regulations have any have a role to play in that? Right, well, I, I don't think so anymore. Mm -hmm. I, they were up until uh, up until two years ago, and now that's changed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, America's got great uh, design designers, great UI experts. Um, it, it was just a, a matter of time uh, until they embraced the, the, the technology and, and you know, they'll, they'll succeed as, as well as anyone. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Francis. We really appreciate you spending time with us today. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers.